All right. So if that's all cleared up, um, let's get back to Ansel. Uh, so, um, first of all, are there any questions or lingering things to discuss, lingering concerns, uh, or anything at all about the previous dialogue on freedom of choice? Anything back there that we want to uh, want to go back over and discuss, uh, or anything that came to mind as you were reading the third dialogue um, about anything we've already gone over? Huh? All right, well, if we do need to do any kind of callbacks or anything, feel free to let me know. That's because these are, uh, well, they're published together in the same book for good reason. They are quite closely linked. Um, so <clears throat> there are a lot of connections between them. Uh, his, well, for example, I mean, the definition of justice that we've been talking about, um, preservation, of rectitude of the, uh, preservation of rectitude of the will maintained for its own sake, um, is continued all throughout th all three of these dialogues, and that's something he develops in the first one that we didn't really read. Um, so things like that are going to be continuing all the way through here. All right. So my plan for now, um, I want to take as much time as we need to sort of slowly and carefully go through this third dialogue, um, because it is the longest and it's probably also the most complicated and in-depth. Um, so if that means that this week and next week, uh, Tuesday, Thursday, Tuesday, Thursday are all going through uh, on the fall of the devil. Okay, cool. Uh, that'll be fine by me. Um, I'm still hoping uh, that if we finish it before then, uh, that we have at least next Thursday to go back and talk uh, and talk again about the Euthyphro um, that we talked about last, uh, right at the beginning of the semester, uh, as a kind of bookend to our discussion. So we can kind of go back and think about, rethink about that. Uh, sort of having the context of everything that we've already discussed and talked about. All right, so to begin, anything in the third dialogue on Fall of the Devil that you want to talk about first that I should clear up, anything that uh, that was odd or unclear or utterly mystifying, yeah? What, you probably said this before. Or Maybe. Just what is quasi something? <laughs> I've not said that before, and you probably will get nothing if you Google it. So good question. Very good question. So quasi something. So quasi is the, the, the prefix that is used in Latin that just gets transliterated straight into English without translation. It means basically semi or kind of. So quasi something means that it's kind of something, but it's not actually something. Um, and this is in his discussion of what nothing means and what nothingness means, right? Um, so uh, this is where he gets into a fairly long tangent about the philosophy of language and what words, uh, what words indicate and what they signify, and what especially complicated, difficult, weird terms like nothing and evil signify, because nothing is supposed to mean nothing. But if it means nothing, then how can it mean something? Because not because something because nothing is not something, and. Right, we can see where, where, where this goes weird. So when he says that uh, terms like evil and nothing signify quasi something, it's to say that they don't actually signify something. But they signify, maybe we can say, in relation to something. Right? So when I say there is, there is nothing there, that is meant to contrast it with, with there being something. Yeah. It signifies like the absence of something else, kind of. Yeah, like, right. Evil is so just the absence of good, like it's not something in, a, in and of itself. Exactly, and that's what he's getting at, right? He's getting at the privation theory of evil um, as a kind of extension of the privation theory of nothing, and nothingness. Um, <clears throat> this is actually a, um, a significant problem for philosophers. Um, if you do want to Google something that's fairly nonsensical but, but utterly fascinating, if you're into that sort of thing, um, look into the philosophy of holes. There's like a 60-page article on it in the, in the um, what, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy or something? I think the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy one is incredibly long, the philosophy of holes. What is a hole? Because, I mean, I have, for example, a buttonhole in my sleeve. There is nothing there. But if I move my sleeve, the hole seems to move, but nothing is moving. So how do we define a hole? Well, it's it's defined in part by its delineation, by its borders, right? So nothing is in contrast to the something around it. But that can't be right either, 
Because when we talk about there, if, if nothing existed, then it wouldn't be contained by anything or bordered by anything or in relation to anything because there would be nothing in relation to it. So nothing has to signify just nothing. But it means something. But it also means not something or the lack of something. So this is why it's weird. Did that make any sense at all? Yeah, no, it did. Okay. Um, we'll go into more of the specifics of what he means there, like kind of trying very, very, very carefully to go through step by step uh, his argument for what exactly is being referred to when we say nothing. Because that will lead directly into what exactly is being referred to when we say evil. Right? Because that's the more interesting question for, for the purposes of action theory. So how it is we make decisions, right? Deciding between good and evil, deciding between yes and no, uh, this or that, uh, justice and advantage, to sort of use his example. Um, and so evil in this sense, we have to be very, very careful that we're not thinking that it is this uh, a thing uh, that exists, <clears throat> but rather it is a, um, like a lack of something, right? It indicates that there is not something where we would expect there to be. Something like that. Very good question. Yeah. All right. Any other terms like that or, or explanations like that that we should probably go over first? All right. No problem. I'm sure we'll run into some more as we go through because, again, this is. Um, as I indicated, in addition to being the longest of the three dialogues, um, probably the most in-depth and the most complicated as well. Um, so we're, we're going to have to go through this relatively slowly and figure out exactly what he's saying. So to start at the beginning, starting in chapter one, um, I want to ask you guys a question, kind of open this up to, uh, to discussion. So he begins this dialogue by asking whether St. Paul's statement, uh, what do you have that you did not receive, whether this is asked of angels as well as human beings. So in the context, uh, this is from uh, St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Uh, the church in Corinth had a problem with people boasting about virtue, saying that, you know, competing over who was the most virtuous or the most charitable or gave the most to the church or gave the most to the poor or whatever. Um, basically, kind of what we were talking about in when we were discussing on freedom of choice, where people were doing the right things for the wrong reasons, right? for selfish, self-aggrandizing, or vainglorious reasons. And so St. Paul is admonishing them and saying, well, what do you have that you do not receive, including these virtues that you possess, these good qualities, this charity? You get that from somewhere. It's not like you came up with your own goodness. You receive your goodness from, from God, right? As created, finite, contingent beings, we're causally dependent upon something beyond ourselves. Right? That's how he's reading that. And so he's asking here, OK, does that apply to angels? Or are angels in some way self-existent or subsistent? Um, and of course, he winds up concluding that no. Right? Angels have everything that they have received from their creator because they are finite things. Right? They are particular. They are contingent, all of that. But this kind of raises the question, why is he talking about angels all of a sudden? Because so far, he's been talking about language in the first one. What does truth mean? Um, and then the second one, he was talking about human will, our ability to make choices and how it is that we make choices, we human beings. And now suddenly, he wants to, without really any signposts or saying why, he wants to shift the discussion to angels. Why discuss angels? What do you guys think? I have talked about this a little bit before. Yeah? They're kind of like in between humans and God, kind of? Yeah, so they are, they are higher than we are on the sort of chain of ontology. They're, uh -huh. they're more perfect in a lot of ways but than we are. God. But certainly not God. They're still finite. Uh -huh. uh, they're still particular. They're still contingent. Um, but they're, they are closer to perfection than we are. Uh, particularly the good angels, the unfallen angels, are, uh, they, they lack a lot of our falls, uh, our faults due to the fall, sorry. Um, and so it seems like uh, that the choices that angels would make would be, 
maybe we should say they maybe we can say they have a they have a closer affinity to God and so uh, a more finely tuned um, <clears throat> will for justice I guess we can say right to use again use Anselm's terms so that's part of it right so we want to we want to try and figure out the 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 highest and the purest case. But why else? I think there are a few other reasons as well we can address. Why else does he want to talk about angels now? Right. So, but, but why the devil, right? So uh, this is really the question that, that comes up. Why does he want to talk about the fall of the devil when maybe by comparison or by contrast, why talk about the fall of Satan when he could talk about the fall of Adam? Right. The fall of man seems to be a lot more relevant, uh, or a lot, uh, at least a lot closer, to how and why it is that we make moral choices. Right. So, why the devil? Why Satan? Why the the fall or the uh, the justice of angels rather than human beings? ideas? I mean, we covered one major reason, which is their closeness to God. They're, they're, that we don't have to deal with fallenness, right? at least from the outset. Um, with human beings, we have to deal with, with, at least if we're talking about us as human beings, we have to worry about our fallenness. right? We have um, uh, what the medievals, what the scholastics would call concupiscence, which is a, an inclination towards sin. We have temptations and things like that. Um, the angels, especially before the fall, d don't really have to worry about this. Right? It's not a concern, so that's one less thing to worry about. Um, and we can look at um, choices which are more directly involving the divine, right? obedience to God or disobedience to God, rather than looking at you know, human choices like, do I help someone or do I help myself? Right? That's a much more complicated question, morally speaking. Now, there's a couple of other reasons that are related to this, um, at least that I, that I can point out. And, and I will say in the introduction to this, the translator, um, uh, Thomas Williams, points out some of the reasons for this as well. Um, one of which is certainly that, uh, well, if, if angels don't have to worry about the complication of fallenness, of original sin, well, there's a lot of other things about angels that are far, far simpler when it comes to moral psychology than for human beings. So what do we have that angels don't? Bodies. Right. We're corporeal. Right? Angels, if they exist, even, even as hypotheticals, right, this, this still functions as a thought experiment. Angels are pure mind. They are pure soul, pure intellect. We are uh, what, uh, what the scholastics called hylomorphic composites. We are part mind, part body in a united whole. And so our body affects our decision making, affects, affects our choices, our ability to choose, our ability to do things at least as much, or at least in its own independent way from our pure intellect. Right? <clears throat> we don't have a pure intellect. We are a composite of body and soul, so we have this, we have this rational capacity for abstract, um, purely voluntary or purely spontaneous choice. But we also have things like emotions, passions, appetites, um, distractions. If we want to get really technical, even things like temporal progression, we experience time in a very uh, in a very um, uh, causal and linear sort of way. Whereas angels have something closer to the relationship that God has to time, um, yeah. So that means like something could happen to a human that like turns them away from like doing something, and that affects them for the rest of their life. Yeah. So something can happen to a human being that will affect them, yeah. that can actually be a change imposed from the outside. This is something that we don't have to be concerned about with angels. Angels are not quite ah say they're not independent in the same way that God is. But they're not affected by materiality like we are. Right? If a human being is starving, like dying of starvation, 
that is going to have a significant impact on what they choose to do. Right? Um, and that may even lead to immoral choices, right? To, to steal to survive and things like that, right? And that might even do things like mitigate culpability. In other words, if there is a sufficient um, a sufficient physical compulsion for something, we may not be fully blameworthy for the actions that we do, that we undertake. Like it wouldn't be as bad as I, if I just stole from Starbucks right here than if I was starving and stole from Starbucks. Yeah, It'd be right. worse if I, just right now I did it. Yes, because you wouldn't have um, a compelling reason to, right? Yeah. Right now, I had lunch before class. I'm full. Um, but if I were to just walk up, walk up to somebody eating lunch over there and just walk off with their bagel, right, and start eating it as I walk away, that would be a, a significantly more evil action than if I were to, uh, you know, not having eaten th for three days for whatever reason, uh, quickly snatch it while they're not looking and, and, you know, leave a note apologizing or something, right? There are significant differences between these actions, and the differences are largely on account of our, our corporeality, our bodies. This isn't something we have to be concerned about with respect to angels. If we're talking about angelic choices, angels are being pure spirit, pure soul, they don't have to worry about these impacts that corporeality has or about things that even about, um, how would I put this? The succession of choices that we make, right? So if I make a choice today, that's going to limit and affect my options for choice tomorrow, right? So if I, if I choose today um, to, I don't know, something, something that is plausible but unlikely that I would not do but won't, but could, um, if I chose to uh, drive recklessly on the way home tonight. Sell your house. Sure. To use a less morally heinous example, yeah. right? Uh, if I just sell, if I sold my house today. Without another house. Just yeah, just it. to the highest bidder just of, of you guys. Yeah. Whoever wants to give me the most for my house, I'll just go for it. Right? That would severely limit my options of what I can do tomorrow. Yeah. Right? Angels don't work like this because their choice, choice in the singular, um, is made at the beginning of their existence. When they are, when, well, all of this stuff that Anselm is talking about happens. When they're given this choice by God, and that determines their, their fundamental nature moving forward. So they have precisely one choice to worry about. Whereas we have this succession of choices that limit one another. Um, and so moral issues for human beings get incredibly, incredibly complicated, which is why ethics is hard. Right? Careful study of ethics is very, very difficult. And this is why you wind up with crap like trolley problems that everyone hates. Because yes, the, the, as many variables as you try to limit, you can still introduce more, and it can get more and more and more complicated. Right? And that's the point of a thought experiment, right? Is to limit variables, is to isolate the one thing that you want to change. And what better example is there than looking at moral psychology of a purely rational being that is making a choice, practically speaking, in an ethical vacuum, right? You know, physics ex physics experiments do this thing where they say assume a frictionless vacuum, right? For for calculation purposes, that's what we're doing when we're saying when we're talking about angels and making choices. So that's one aspect of it, to simplify things, to get to the very essence of what it is to make a moral choice. The other element here, though, is familiarity, but openness to experimentation. So what I mean is, um, if, if instead, suppose, Anselm were wanting to talk about the fall of Adam, human sin, well, there's a lot we know about that from Revelation. Right. We, we have a great deal of information about how that went, why it went the way that it did, and what the choices were, and what the alternatives were, and what the options were, and why Adam chose what he chose, what else was involved, and the consequences of it, all of that. Right. All of that was relatively clear uh, right, from the tradition, from Revelation, etc. Whereas the information available about uh, the fall of Satan is much more sparse. We know that Satan fell. We know that he was, um, he was uh, the most glorious of the angels. And we know that it had something to do with pride. It's kind of it. Right? Everything else is speculation, which is really handy 
if you want to try to speculate and try and test out different scenarios and situations and see what must this have been like or what could this have been like if this happened, right? you can experiment more with, it, more with it if you have fewer constraints based on what you know about the situation. It can still be based on something that everyone knows something about. right? Everyone is roughly familiar with the fall of Satan insofar as it had something to do with pride and something, with, so something to do with disobedience to God. And it was at the, the primal moment of creation. But beyond that, we can come up with our own details for the sake of experimentation. Right? So it's a kind of familiarity, but with, but with some room to speculate, um, which makes it much, much more useful than something like uh, the fall of man, where we have a lot of detail. Um, and a lot of those details just complicate matters further to get to the other one. All right. So that's why. That's why, at least I think, why he chooses to focus on uh, the fall of the devil right? and this um, the, the question of angelic free choice rather than human free choice. All right, so any other questions on why that is and why the, why the, why the conversation switches so drastically from, uh, from human free will to angelic free will? No? All right. So chapter one, now that that's all of that is out of the way, bless you. <clears throat> now that that's all out of the way, there was a lot of preamble there. But uh, So in chapter one, he's asking about what it is that we receive and what it is that we have of our own accord. Bless you. Bless you. Uh, if there is anything that we have of our own accord at all, and the implication is no, right? The expected obvious answer to this question that St. Paul asks in Corinthians is no. Right? There is nothing that we, that we have that we did not receive, because that would make us, in some way, self-existent. That would make us necessary beings, basically. We are contingent. We are finite. We are causally dependent upon other things, um, most, most notably God, but even mundane things, like our parents, or even things like our environment. Right. If our environment were radically different, we would be fundamentally different. Right. Things like that. <clears throat> and so, because we are so finite and contingent, and even angels are finite and contingent, especially in relation to God, what we have, even mentally, even with respect to our capacity for free choice, is derivative. It's not intrinsic to us. Right. And so we can't take credit for it, is the point he's getting at here. But this presents apparent problems. Um, so first of all, it seems as if, and this is kind of blending together the first three chapters here, but we'll pick it apart as we go. It seems as if God is morally responsible for sin. So for Satan's fall, to use this example in particular, because it seems like God either took away justice or his rectitude of the will, uh, or never gave it to him in the first place, and so would be responsible for that. And that's a problem because it would be unjust to punish someone for something that you are doing to them. Right. So if, if we and the angels are just puppets, Right? If, if we only act through the divine will, it seems to be the height of injustice uh, for God to then punish us for things that he's basically forcing us to do. Right? So that can't quite be right. There has to be something else to it. Right? And so he begins by making this distinction between how it is that we say people are caused to have things and not to have things. And this is in chapter one, the sort of second half of chapter one. So this is that distinction between um, causing someone to not have something by taking back what you've lent. This is the lending someone's cloak, lending someone your cloak, and when you take it back, the question of whether you cause them to be naked by taking it back. And in this case, and someone's going to say that ultimately no. Right. You are not the cause of their nakedness or their uncloakedness. Right? 
that they fundamentally are, or it is no one's fault in particular. Right? So if you lend some if you lend someone something, if you give something to somebody and then you take it back, it is not your fault that they are back to the state where they began. Because they were in that state anyway from the start. Right? And he wants to extend this principle upwards to God, because if if say right, if, for example, we exist, right? We're alive, we're we're living and corporeal and all that stuff. Let's not go quite all the way to God, but let's go with a, uh, a, a sort of closer to earthly example. Part of why you are alive is your parents, right? So they are causally responsible for giving you life, at least in part. Cool. When you die, will that be your parents' fault? OK, fair enough. Hopefully not. Right? I, mean, I mean, I suppose it is possible right, if, that it could be your parents' fault through accident or maybe otherwise. Um, I'm not pointing fingers at anyone, obviously. Um, but if that is the case, right? If, if it's not the case that they are not directly responsible for your death, just because they gave you something, life in this case, that is temporary, that will eventually go away, does not mean that you are responsible, that, sorry, that it doesn't mean that they are responsible for your ceasing to have what they gave you, right? life in this case. And so naturally, the same applies to God. If God gives us something by creating us, by bringing us into being, and then we cease to have that for whatever reason, whether that is God taking it away directly, or whether that is simply us losing it naturally, that shouldn't be considered God's fault right? or God's causal doing. In particular, things that we were going to lose anyway. Life being the key example of this, right? We're all going to die. That's kind of what we do as human beings, as creatures, as you know, animals. And so, when we do, it's not like uh, it's not quite right to say that that God is responsible for our deaths because God gave it gave us life that wasn't permanent. Right? Because of course it wasn't permanent. We're finite. We're mutable. We're contingent. Yeah. But in the same way, isn't it the person? Isn't it not the person who received its fault either? It, right. Yeah. In that case. Yeah. Absolutely. So right? then it shouldn't be humans' fault per se. Some things, though. For some things, right? So you would say that it's not your parents' fault that you die of old age someday, right? Now, you would also not say that it's your parents' fault that you died because you did something really stupid. Like, as an adult, once you know better, right? Suppose you know better and you decide to, um, uh, don't try this at home, but when, we were in, when I was in middle school, have I told you this? Have I told you about the, the game Frogger that I used to play in middle school? No? It's very much like the arcade game. It's where you take your shoes off, you untie them, throw them into the middle of the road, run into the road, put them back on, and tie them before you get hit by a car. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, don't do this. Do not do this, please. I beg you not to do this. Um, this is incredibly unwise. I was a preteen boy, which are mo the most danger-prone human beings in existence. But if you were, you know, your age or older and knew better not to do something so ridiculously stupid as this, and then went and did it anyway, it's not your parents' fault. In that case, it would be your fault, uh -huh. right? So. It could be your fault. It could be someone else's fault. It could be no one's fault in particular. Um, or, I mean, it could, in principle, be your parents' fault. But so, we wouldn't say that about God, just because you know God doesn't so if, ordinarily spite people. Yeah. Go ahead. So if you're like about to get hit by a car, and your parent sees you and sees the car coming, you have headphones in. And they have the, or not that you have headphones in, but you just uh -huh. don't see the car for some reason or don't uh -huh. hear it. And they could yell out to you and say, hey, there's a car coming get out of the road, but they don't. Then isn't it kind of their fault? Only in an improper sense. Because mm -hmm. God can do everything. 
Right. So if humans were to mess up in the beginning, mm -hmm. and he knew that it was going to happen, and he could have prevented it, but he didn't, isn't that kind of the same as doing it? It's not the same. It's similar. It is relevantly similar, and that, that winds up being important. But it's not quite the same. And the reason it's not the same is, uh, is that it is, that is more like getting something back that you've lent someone right, than it is taking something away that, that was somebody's in the first place. Right? Because by, you know, by your, your parent not warning you that there's a car coming or something like that, um, what they are doing is they are allowing, they are allowing something to happen to you that something else is causing, or maybe you're causing, or maybe someone else is causing, or what have you. Yeah. They could prevent it, but that's the same sense in which that uh, maybe this book is allowing me to see the lamppost over there. Right? It is, because it could stop it. Right? It could do this. Right? This book is allowing the sun to get in my eyes, because it could do that. But I will look very ridiculous if I spend the whole class like this. Right? I'm not going to do that. Um, it's not. Or maybe let's go with something with uh, something with a will, something with capable of spontaneous decisions. Maybe one of you guys could stand up and be shade for me in class. And the fact that you're not means that you're blameworthy for me having sun in my eyes. Yeah. No, I mean, yes, but only improperly speaking. Right. Now, this does get complicated by the particular relationship between parents and children being a kind of, um, being a kind of um, obligation of uh, rearing and protection, that sort of thing, uh, at least up to a certain point. Um, if my mom knew that I played Frogger in middle school, it probably would have been irresponsible of her not to stop me from doing something so ridiculously stupid, right? Because I was, you know, 11 or 12. Aren't all humans intelligence-wise like little children to God? Yes, yes. So we're always like little kids. Yes. Well, yes, kind of. And why I say kind of um, is because the the reason that the reason that parents have a particular obligation to children is twofold. On the one hand, it's the difference in intellect, the difference in rational capacity. But it's the specific kind of difference as well. Right? Adults have the capacity for rational abstraction and such. Right? Uh, we are capable of foreseeing the consequences of our actions and acting upon that, right? acting rationally given that. Um, children are generally not capable of doing that until, you know, well, it depends. Right? Uh, and that's something that also gradually happens. And, and this is why we have a very long period of childhood development for, for human beings, because we need to learn and develop our capacity for rational abstraction, which is a difficult thing. But once we have that, once we have that capability, even if it's of a limited capacity, right, because we are finite, we're not perfect by any means. We're not perfectly intelligent. We're not perfect in will, in anything. We are capable of rational abstraction and, uh, and acting accordingly. So as, as developed adult human beings, we have a kind of um, uh, moral responsibility. Right? We, are, we do become responsible, responsible for our own actions to some degree. And so to say that there is, a, uh, there is this difference between us and God, like there is between parent and child, is analogous in some sense. But if you take it as a one-to-one -one comparison, it's infantilizing right, for human beings. Right? Because it treats, it treats conscious and aware human beings as if we're not conscious and aware, right? as if we're not persons, we're not fully developed persons. The other aspect of it, the other aspect of the parental obligation, is the special obligation as parents to children bearing responsibility for bringing them into the world. This is something where God is much closer. Yeah. Right. And this is why, uh, for example, we will wind up looking into like why it is that it's not. It's not God's doing. For. Uh, Let's just stick to the particular example. It's not God's doing for Satan to reject God right? or to, to abandon rectitude of the will. It is Satan's doing, and we'll look at exactly how. Because in chapter 3, which is probably the most complex and the, kind of my favorite of these chapters, um, but he looks at the mechanics of how that is and why it is that it's, 
it is Satan's doing, and it's and if most importantly, I think that if God were to prevent that, it would be preventing Satan from existing as a person. And I think that is the key. Right? That, that's the key distinction. Um, and I think this is right. This is. Um, we have to get into the very precise mechanics of how this works and why this works. Like I was kind of alluding to last uh -huh. week, um, which which is a lot of well, chapter three, and then a lot onwards into the sort of middle, the big middle section here of like six through fourteen or so, I think. Um, that goes into why it is that God can't just say why it is that God can't compel uh, creatures to be uh, to to obey, to be just, to be good do something that would be ultimately conducive to their own flourishing, which part of what we know, we know to be justice or goodness. Mm. I also feel, though, like, yeah, it's like free will for humans to be able to choose to sin. It's like God doesn't have the ability to sin but still has free will, so he could have made humans the same way, just to a lesser degree or something. You know? Like, and we still have free will, like, because we determined that free will, by definition, mm -hmm. isn't Sinning or not sinning, you right. know what I mean? So yeah. we could still have free will without the fall of man. So he's going to go on to explain, or at least attempt to explain, why that can't be the case, right? Why it can't be that you have free will simply without the ability to sin. Unless you're God. Now, we have to be careful about that. Because I think on, on this reading, I think Anselm would have to be committed to, to the conclusion that God is metaphysically, let me put it this way, the only reason God might not be metaphysically capable of sinning is because God is definitive of what it is to be just, right? That, that God could, in principle, fail to be, well, if God could fail to be God, God could be imperfect. There's, there's nothing... There's nothing contradictory about God's power, per se, uh, with, that would prevent him from doing what is unjust. The only thing that would prevent that is the divine nature of being perfection itself. Um, and of course, God being definitive of perfection. But beyond that, he would hold that the good angels, who are eternally preserved from sin, they cannot but they, 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 they necessarily, I have to be very careful with the phrasing here. They necessarily will never and, uh, will never and would never sin. Remain in some sense capable of doing so. But only in a really limited sense that we're going to have to look at. And Satan just happened to do it. Yeah. And I still, I still feel like too with the fallen man, like, God, like, since he had the capacity to stop it, it just kind of feels like, since he knew everything that was going to happen, like, it says in the Bible, like, only mm -hmm. a few mm -hmm. will go through the narrow gate, like most people. So it's like this one particular event that involves, like, some angel who's necessarily not supposed to sin, but just somehow slipped through the cracks. He mm -hmm. could have prevented that, and it would have stopped, like, 90% of all people who have ever lived from going to hell eternally. And he was just like, ah, eh, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, it sucks. Because angels aren't even supposed to be able to. He could have just... Right. That, that part's true, right? So, actually, I mean, realistically, no one's supposed to. angels defective. <laughs> Get rid of them. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, now, I mean, we can also say that... I'm going to say we have to come back to that. Because that's a good point. Right? Why did God permit Satan to tempt man? Yeah. That's a really good point. Because he knew it was going to happen. Yeah. And I think that we have to address that um, maybe Thursday? Yeah. We'll see. We'll see if we get to that on Thursday. Because that's, that's indirectly addressed here. Uh -huh. But only indirectly. I kind of, I'm going to need to draw attention to it. he's perfect in everything, weird. and he makes these angels who are supposedly almost perfect, like 99.99, .99, like hand sanitizer yeah. or something, like in the 0.01% of sin just happened to slip in under God's nose. You know what I mean? That depends, right? So, perfect, you know? That really depends. Because, I mean, we don't have numbers, 
Um, we, we really don't have numbers no, as far as the number of... have to sin about, you know what I mean? Like, if you well, that's what we're going to have to look at, too. Yeah. That, that's where, if you recall, that's where he's talking about that something extra. Yeah. Right? It's the desire for advantage, for, for what one can gain for oneself. Right. And, and it's, that, it's, that, it's that that allows the angels to make a choice and to, so to genuinely choose um, justice and to choose to love God. We'll have to look at exactly what that means because it's, it's weird and he's really vague about it, but I think we can kind of come to something like a conclusion. And I feel like if these angels were perfect, you know what I mean? Like, or not perfect because they're not God, but so close to perfect, mm -hmm. they would know that like you can't be better than God. You know what I mean? Like, what did he think? Was yeah, happen? and like, and he has to. He he does address that right in what is it, chapter five, I think. I feel like humans are smarter than that. Like, if we lived in heaven, we saw him face to face, no one was going to be like, yeah, yeah. can take this guy down. Like, no, it's chapter right, four. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's chapter four, right? Where he talk, where he addresses how it is, how how is it that Satan thought he could be like God? Because he's not stupid. Yeah. Right. He's the, at, at this point, before at least before the the creation of man and the the glorification of man at the end of time, all yada yada yada. Before all that, Satan was the pinnacle of creation, right? the, the the most glorious of the angels. He had to have known that he could not be or be like God. But we have to look at in what way he thought he could be like God. And it's a really, really narrow sense. Um, because, I mean, by Anselm's reading, that's the only sense we have left. Right? Because we know it was that he willed to be like God. And it was a kind of pride. And it was a kind of choosing to renounce something that God had given him. It's kind of all the information we have. And so given all that, we have Anselm here trying to figure out exactly what that might mean, what that might look like. Mm. So, to look at this distinction in particular, right, into chapters two and three, because we—that was all chapter one. Um, like I said, this is really in depth. I expect to get to get through most of three today, if the other classes are any indication. So we'll see. Um, so. When we get into chapter two and then chapter three, because these fit together quite well, this is where he's asking, um, why does it seem like God is causally responsible for Satan's fall? Because right? it certainly seems to be the case. God could have prevented it. And it seems like the only reason Satan would have had for falling was if God did not give him perseverance of the will. God did not give him justice, the, the, the capacity and the action to obey and to be just and to, to follow God's will and all of that stuff. Right? And so, in chapter 3, we get this distinction. Oh, it's not true. In chapter 3, we get like six different distinctions. This is the first one. So we get this distinction between the, the direction of causality between giving and receiving and between not giving and not receiving. So this is that beginning part of chapter 3. So the bottom of 57 and defeat, on to 58. This is where I drew the little heart in the margin. This is that part, if you recall. <clears throat> so he lays out, OK, so if I give you something, I am causally responsible for you having it, right? Fair enough. So if I, gave you a, if I give you a, uh, to use a, classic, a class analogy, if I give you a grade, I am causally responsible for you having that grade. Hmm. Now we can set aside concerns of merit and stuff because we don't want to. We don't want to work on that. We don't. That's that's a separate concern, whether you earned the grade or whether it was arbitrary or whatever. By contrast, if I do not give you a grade, that causes you not to have one. Right? There are notes that you guys have turned in that I haven't graded yet, and therefore you don't have you don't have a grade for them. Or if you've turned in your paper early and, you, and you've turned it in, I haven't graded it, therefore you don't have a grade. Right? So in that case, at least some of the time, not giving can be the cause of not receiving. However, Anselm wants to point out that the converse can be true as well, that not receiving can be the cause of not giving. So to use the grade example, suppose I put a grade in for, uh, for, your, for someone's logic quiz. And this was some time before midterms, and that, that, understandably, they get a little bit freaked out about that and decide to drop the class. Have I given them a grade for the course? 
a final grade. Yeah. Or even, interestingly, even the, the grade for the logic quiz. I mean, it won't stick. So like... Exactly. The grade isn't there. There is no grade. Right? They're, they're out of my system. They're out of V2L. They're not signed up. They're, I, have, I have not given them the grade. But it's not because I didn't give it that they don't receive it. It's because they don't receive it that I can't give it. Right? It's, what he's talking about here is the rejection of something being the cause for why it isn't given. So when we say that God gives, gives different things to different people, yeah. But that's not God's doing. Not properly speaking. Right? If God gives justice, perseverance of the will, whatever you want to call it, to some people and not to others, it, it isn't because God doesn't give it to them that they don't have it. It's because they don't receive it that God doesn't give it to them. OK, so how does this work? How is it that Satan can deny God? That seems like attributing a lot of power to Satan that we probably shouldn't. OK, well, he goes into explaining the mechanics of choice. There's another distinction that he makes in chapter 3. Uh, this is more on uh, sort of the next page, um, onto 59 or so, if you're following along. This is where he points out that there are, there's a three-step process to willing something. So in order to will something, you need, there are three parts that you need. So let me illustrate by example. Um, Are you, you each of you, um, capable of eating? And raise your hand if you're capable of eating. OK. Keep your hand up if you are hungry, if you want to eat. OK. I'm not in particular, just ate. OK. Keep your hand up if you are eating. OK. I didn't think so. Right? So that's one example where you have two of these things, but not the third. OK. All right, who here is capable of standing? Okay, who is, who wants to? Okay, therefore you're not. All right, cool. One more example. Who is capable of unaided flight? Right, I didn't think so. Um, cool, so that's where it stops. So we have this three-step process of the capacity for something, the ability to do something. Right? This is, all of these are called the will, right? but we mean slightly different things. The will, as in the capacity for choice, the ability to choose something. Right? In this case, you don't have the will to fly because you're not capable of choosing to fly. You do have the will to stand or to eat because you're capable of both of those things. OK, now you might not have the will, the next step, to stand if you don't want to. The next step is the desire or the inclination towards doing something. Right? It is the will to, uh, say, the will to stand or the will to eat. This is how we talk about, um, you know, most commonly we find this, this used as an example of uh, sort of the the will to keep going, or the will to finish, or the um, the will to persevere, the desire to complete something, the desire to do something. We still talk about this as a will, but this is that next step. So if you don't have the first thing, you're not going to have this. Usually, because you might have the inclination or the desire to say fly unaided. You might love the idea of just taking off and flying around, right? Fine, but that can only be the case because you either do not understand or are temporarily ignoring your inability to do so. I'll come back to that because that winds up being important. The third is the will, or, or what we would call the act of willing, or the activation. Right? The actual making the choice to eat or to stand or whatever. 
Now, I didn't use an example of this, but we can say sitting, right? We're all capable of sitting. We are all, uh, we all have a desire to remain sitting, so it would seem. And we all are, in fact, sitting. So we have all three steps. We have all three parts here. And that means that the will is carried out through to completion. We have finished willing sitting in this case. OK. At any stage here, something can stop our choice. We can either not have the capacity for it, we do not have the ability to choose something. By not having the ability to do it, um, this is things that these would be things like that we're not either physically or metaphysically capable of doing. This is the least common because we don't really think about those things. Right? We don't think about things that we're just not capable of doing most of the time. <clears throat> you might not have the inclination for something. You might not want something. Whether that is a um, uh, to use, I guess, psychology terms, whether that's a trait or a state, right? Whether that means that you are, you always don't really have, you always don't have the inclination or the desire for something, or you don't right now, right? This is the difference between, say, I don't have the particular desire, the current desire right now to stand, but I might also not have the desire um, to drink coffee made of dryer lint, as I've used as an example before. I right? just put dryer lint in my coffee maker and make it out of that. Right? That is something that I just don't have the, the, the will for ever. Whereas standing, I do sometimes, but not others. Right? So this can be something consistent, or this can be something changing. Now, the activation, the act of willing, the actual choice that we make, that will only happen if you have the capacity, you have the inclination, and then you act on it. There's an extra step there. All right. So what is Satan missing? Is it the ability to choose, the inclination for justice, or the actual activation, the actual choice? The choice and the inclination? Not initially. So first the inclination. So it goes the other way, actually. So he has the in inclination for justice. We'll look at exactly why that is as well. Oh, because he's an angel? Yeah, because he was created with it. And this is right at the end of chapter 3. He goes into this as well. So Satan is created with the inclination or the will for justice, just like all of the angels, just like you know, all rational creatures, us as well. But he does not choose it. He activates the contrary. He chooses against justice, and so therefore loses the inclination for justice at least in one sense that we'll, we'll, again, wind up looking at because it's very complicated um, as to how this works exactly. I keep saying that, but I hope I wind up delivering. We'll get there. But it's initially the act of rejection that we were talking about was an act of the activation or lack of activation of the will. It's not a lack of a. It's not a lack of a capacity, and it's not a lack of an inclination. It's simply that last part. That the will was not actually choosing the end, the end in mind, justice. What time do we have? What time is it? How much do we have? How do we have? Three forty-one. Okay. Oh, plenty of time. Plenty of time. All right. So there's one other distinction here in chapter three that kind of informs this, as to why it is that. He does initially have this inclination for justice, but then it, then it goes away, then he leaves, then he abandons it, and so it leaves him. And this is the question between, uh, it's a distinction that is, <laughs> is really hard to figure out in translation. Uh, this is on 61, so basically the whole page of 61, uh, still in chapter 3. Uh, and it's the difference between not willing and willing against. Does anyone get this? Does anyone understand this one right off the bat upon reading? So not willing something versus willing against something. How would we describe that, maybe? So Satan didn't not want justice to happen. Mm -hmm. He just didn't want it to happen enough. Careful, because I think it winds up being the opposite of that, if I'm, if I'm understanding exactly what you're saying. So he... Use a, use a more down-to-earth example, like human example. 
So if we can do that first. Okay, I have a couple examples I'll, I'll give it a shot for. But first of all, the, the reason this is weird and difficult is because it's a word we don't have a word for in English that there is a simple compound word for in Latin that just kind of means this. So it's the difference between the Latin term non vele, so not willing, uh, or to not will, or not to will, and nole, which is just willing against, or the contrary of willing. Something like rejection, rejecting something. Right? Willing not for there to be something. Willing the opposite of something. So willing to get rid of it. justice to happen, but also didn't. Yeah, he wanted, he, he had an inclination for justice. He had a desire for it. He had a will for it. But he also had, let's say, a stronger will for there not to be justice for particular reasons that, that again, we'll get to. So example, I suppose I were to offer you a dessert platter. Uh, you have three options. You can have cake, you can have pie, or you can have cat poop. Raise your hand if you would prefer cake. OK, raise your hand if you would prefer pie. Raise your hand if you would prefer cat poop. OK, I didn't think so. All right, so one of these options you have willed. You've chosen. Right? You have the capacity, you have the inclination, and you've chosen. You've, act you've activated the choice. Um, most of us, it was cake. So let's just go with that. One of them, you have simply not willed the pie. You don't have the particular, the particular will for pie as much as you do for cake. And so it's not like you're rejecting it. Right? If it were offered on its own, you would probably accept it. Probably. I don't know your, your taste in particular. But there's a good chance that if it were offered on your own, if I said, hey, have some pie, you'd say, yes, thank you. Right? But in the case where I'm saying cake or pie, you'll select cake and you'll leave the pie alone. Now, on the other hand, you will, you will, uh, I hate the future tense in English when I'm talking about the will, but here we go. You will will against or will to reject cat poop every time, regardless of what the alternatives are. Right? You're not going to choose it, not because you just don't particularly want it. It's that you want it not to be on your plate. Right? You want to reject it. You will against it. OK. Now, he wants to draw one further distinction within this distinction, which is the order of these things. Because we find that in a lot of cases, we, not, we, we both will against something and not will it. But the causal sequence of these can go one way or the other. It can go either way, right? You can not will something because you have willed against it or you've rejected it. Or you can reject something because you do not will it. Right, so the first example of this is like, uh, he uses an example of a hot coal. We can do the same thing with the cat poop, whatever. You can will against something because you first do not will it. Right? Before I introduced the idea of cat poop, nobody wanted any in particular, right? You had no particular will or desire for cat poop, right? presumably. And so once I hypothetically offered it to you, because you already didn't want it, you had no will for it, then you willed against it. Once it was before you, once you had the opportunity to reject it, you then did. So it, in that case, it begins with not willing, and that leads to willing against. All right, the other example he uses is like paying for something. Uh, so exchanging money for something. Um, so let's say you've got a coffee that you presumably just got. Um, let's say that was, I don't know, $3? Let's say $3. Let's go with that. Um, OK, so uh, before you bought the coffee, you had $3. You wanted it, right? You didn't want to get rid of it. You had the $3 in your hand. It was a good thing, all that. Okay. You had a will 
for having those three dollars. Again, assuming you paid cash, which is probably counterfactual, but whatever. Okay. If you if you wanted to have those three dollars, why did you give them away? Right, you wanted the coffee instead, or more so. Right? Okay. So because if they had offered her free coffee, she wouldn't have given up the three dollars. Exactly. Right? You would have kept it. And <clears throat> further, you wouldn't have just had the three dollars in your hand and just dropped it down a storm drain. Because yeah. you didn't want it, right? I mean, when you're done with the coffee, you will you will probably not want the empty cup and will probably get rid of it. But you'll will to get rid of it after you already don't want it. Right? So the contrary though, with with the example of the money, you want it. You want to have the three bucks, right? But then you will to abandon it or you will to not have it because you will to have the coffee more so. And the way of getting the coffee is to give away the three dollars, to exchange the two. <clears throat> and so willing to abandon the three dollars comes before not willing to have it. Because before I brought this up, you probably weren't thinking about the three dollars you spent on the coffee or whatever it was and wanting to have that back or anything like that, I'm assuming. Right? You could, hypothetically, probably, maybe, you could maybe even get those three dollars back. Right? Maybe if you just like after you finish your coffee, you go into the you go into Benny's and say, "Hey, you gave me the wrong coffee. Can I have my money back?" And, and just you know talk really talk nicely or angrily at them, whichever works depending on who's there or whatever. You might be able to do that. Right? You might even be able to get back the thing that you wanted initially. But you're probably not going to do that in part because you don't have a particularly strong desire for those three dollars in particular. Uh, and then also because you probably have a stronger desire for justice. You don't want to you know, swindle people out of their money. Something like that. And so what happened was you first willed to abandon the three dollars because you wanted to exchange them for something else. You wanted something else more that was incompatible with keeping that, with keeping that money. And then ultimately wound up not willing that money. You had then you, by willing to abandon it, you you also abandoned your inclination or desire for that particular thing. Right. So one leads to the other, and right, this causal sequence can go either way. And so, and someone's going to argue. This is the next page, right? that it is not that Satan did not have the will for justice and therefore willed to abandon it, but that it's he first willed to abandon it and therefore lost the inclination for it. Right? So he says, this is that last, uh, the last teacher paragraph of chapter 3, it says, um, it, was not because of, it, it was not because his will was faulty God having failed him, failed to give him the will. In other words, not because he didn't have the will for justice, that he did not will what he ought to have willed. But instead, by willing what he ought not, he cast out his good will when an evil will came to exist within him. So he desired something else instead of justice, in favor of justice. The only way to get it, the only way to get that, whatever that was, was by willing to abandon justice. And so he willed to abandon justice, and so he lost his inclination for justice, and so cannot any longer will justice. Now that last part, that's rocketing through. That's way too fast, and the student calls him on it, and that's why they spend the next few chapters trying to figure out why it is exactly that he loses the inclination for justice entirely, because that seems like a jump, because it is a jump. And it still seems like a faulty will to me that an angel would choose to sin rather than maintain their, you know what I mean, the will they already have. Because like humans, it's like, mm -hmm. like you said, they had the fall of man, so human nature is damaged. But like yeah. angelic nature, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, and he's going to have to get around that, right? Mm -hmm. And I think he does, or he tries to, um, to, to sort of indicate way ahead. Um, <clears throat> the, way he, the way he tries to get around this, I think he more or less succeeds in this as well. Uh, the way he avoids that problem is by positing that we have a we have a will for at least two different kinds of things intrinsically, and by we including angels in this, 
and that's justice and advantage. Right? And that neither of those is intrinsically wrong. It's not wrong to want what is good for oneself. However, it is wrong to want what is good for oneself at the expense of yeah. justice, or at the expense of others, or at the expense of relationship with God, or at the expense of something that we ought to desire more. That's where the fault comes in. Right? It's not simply from the will to advantage, because we, we, we will things all the time that are advantageous for us, that are perfectly good and perfectly aligned with justice. The good angels will things for advantage that are perfectly aligned with justice. He goes into that as well. Mm -hmm. right. So that's, it's not like the will for advantage is evil. Yeah. Right. That's an easy mistake to make as well reading this, and one I initially made. Uh, when, I, when I first started looking into this, I was like, wait, he thinks that we ought not to will our own advantage? That doesn't seem right. But no, he doesn't actually, he doesn't actually say that. Right. It's that we have two, we have at least two, because we human beings probably have a lot more innate wills. Right? But we have at least two things that we strive for, that we seek. And that they have a sort of natural hierarchy, right? that our inclination for our will to justice should supersede our will for advantage when they, if and when they come into conflict. But that the will for advantage in itself is not a bad thing. Right? That it is actually a good thing but it needs to be contextualized properly. And I mean, you uh, one could make an argument, and some would not. One could make an argument that even the will for justice needs to be contextualized in some cases. Now, you might have to weird, do weird things with the definition of what the will to justice would be in that case and stuff like that. But yeah, I could see an argument being made for something like that as well. <laughs>